on behalf of Her Excellency Ambassador Patricia O'Brien, I would like to welcome you all warmly to the embassy tonight uh, for what promises to be a fantastic and a thought-provoking uh, debate between the Cambridge Society and the Trinity uh, College Dublin Alumni Association in Paris. I must admit it feels odd welcoming, welcoming you all here today, having only joined the embassy myself as the new cultural attaché uh, two months ago. I'd like to welcome uh, and to thank in particular Andrew Linden Skeggs and Gabriela Bruget behind me uh, of the Cambridge Society and the Trinity Association respectively for all their help over the past few weeks in preparing for this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, when Andrew first shared the chosen proposition for the debate with me, I was amused to hear that uh, Trinity had been chosen to argue against the motion. It reminded me of that quote by William Butler Yeats being Irish, he had an abiding sense of tragedy, which sustained him through temporary periods of joy. <laughs> I was also struck by the expansiveness of the question, is the best yet to come? This seems to me to be such a fundamentally human question, one that has dominated our thinking for millennia, indulging us with wild dreams, but also tyrannizing us with fear and with threat. The proposition invites an evidence-based discussion of statistical trends, most of you are probably aware of the work of Steven Pinker and others who highlight the mountains of evidence for optimism. Of course, there is also abundant evidence pointing to worrying future scenarios of natural catastrophe, unsustainable inequality, and extreme politics, among others. How do we reconcile those realities? While we stand here, the planet is getting hotter and hotter, yet more and more people are escaping from extreme poverty. Which of these facts do we pay more attention to? If we add them together, do we get a positive or a negative integer? But the question cannot only be addressed empirically, for it is also fundamentally an emotional question. For instance, much of our mental health hinges on our subconscious answer to the question, is the best yet to come? I'm no expert, but it would seem to me that depression could be driven in large part by the belief that the future has nothing to offer us but more suffering. And I imagine that a successful intervention by a psychologist must be one that convinces the patient that the best is indeed yet to come. It is also, for that matter, very much a uh, religious question. Most religions since the dawn of time have posited an afterlife of some sort, and these run the gamut between the most blissful and the most terrifying scenarios imaginable, sometimes within the one religion. Samuel Beckett, himself an alumnus of Trinity and a resident of France, in his play Endgame, had the memorable line, do you believe in the life to come? Mine was always that. But to return to more terrestrial matters, the proposition is fundamental to our decision-making as individuals and as organizations. Of course, the question is often only posed subconsciously, and the answer only arrived at intuitively. But as individuals, the question of whether the best is yet to come informs our decisions about all sorts of things, whether to open a savings account, whether to get married, whether to start a family, or even whether to stick it out to the end of a speech that is droning on. <laughs> organizations, too, must grapple with this question. The organization that I work for, the Irish Foreign Ministry, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, took the decision last year to open 26 new diplomatic missions worldwide over the next seven years. This is an incredibly ambitious expansion, and it is optimistic also. For implicit in the decision is a bet that our relations with those countries and with those regions will improve in the years ahead. If we had thought that the best was behind us, that there was no room for improvement in our relations, if we thought that the trade opportunities had been exhausted, or that we had nothing to learn from one another, we would not be putting down those roots. The Ministry is also responsible for a large development aid budget, amounting to over 800 million euro this year. My colleagues working in that field are only too aware of the challenges facing the developing world and the human consequences of extreme poverty. However, their work is also inherently optimistic, for it is predicated on the belief that, though significant challenges exist, we can ultimately change things for the better. Diplomacy is full of reminders of the shortcomings of human nature and dire warnings about the future of our world, but it also provides abundant examples of kindness, compassion, and cooperation. It seems to me that the successful diplomat must be sufficiently cynical to recognize the deficiencies of the international system, while also remaining optimistic enough to identify opportunities to bring about positive change when these arise. That's no mean task, and yet I have been privileged enough to work with many such individuals in my short diplomatic career. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the question that confronts us this evening is a fundamental and deeply complex one, and I cannot wait to see how it is tackled. But when I see the caliber of the distinguished guests among us tonight, this much I know for certain. This evening, in this room, the best is yet to come. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you very much, uh, Liam, for such a thoughtful introduction. Uh, thank you also for uh, hosting this debate um, and the lavish venue that is the Irish Embassy in Paris. Um, well, with uh, more drinks and dinner yet to come, I know which side of uh, the question I'm on, uh, but I'm sure no one in this audience will be influenced by such base considerations. Uh, I'd just like to uh, give a few house rules, explain uh, uh, matters of procedure. Uh, we have uh, three speakers on each side. Um, the side in favor of the motion will speak first, but speakers will alternate. Uh, so one speaker from each side um, taking turns. Uh, between, um, so once two speakers have spoken, we'll have a, a pause um, with the opportunity for interventions from the floor, which however will be limited to one minute each and uh, two interventions, but there will be two breaks, that's four interventions from the floor in total. There's been a preliminary vote uh, before the debate started, which is interesting, so we can compare before and after, uh, and uh, Gabrielle will... Um, Give the results of that. So, uh, for the moment, we have uh, 33 people who voted for the motion is, be is uh, uh, best uh, to come, uh, and 41 people who voted against the motion. <laughs> so. Sounds like the Cambridge side have got their. Uh, I said you guys have got your task cut out. Um, the, the, the first speaker in uh, favor um, of the motion will be Alan Riding. Uh, Alan uh, graduated from Bristol University and was for 30 years um, a correspondent uh, for the New York Times. He spent two decades covering political developments in Latin America and was later the newspaper's Paris bureau chief and European cultural correspondent. He's also known for the various books he has published on um, such varied subjects as Mexico, Shakespeare, opera, and most recently, A Cultural Life of German-Occupied Paris. This debate tonight, can you hear me the first time? Because I know um, our cultural attaché was speaking rather, but I'd rather shout a bit. Is that all right? I will shout. This, um, but not I won't shout, obviously, at our <laughs> distinguished and loyal opposition. Um, it struck me that tonight's debate is not really between Team Cambridge and Team TCD, but between optimists and pessimists. Now, by good fortune, I'm an optimist. But alas, so uh, Gabrielle has just revealed there are some pessimists among you. We know who you are. <laughs> We know where you live. <laughs> because the problem with pessimists is it's very difficult to get them to change their mind. Now, I'll grant you something. Stubborn optimists can be very annoying. My mother was one, and it drove my father crazy. He said, open your eyes, he'd tell her. He'd be sitting with the pessimists tonight. But it's now a privilege to invite you to turn your eyes away from the dark clouds that you see before you and look towards the sunshine that will be promising. Now, I'll grant you that any perusal of any newspaper today will provide ample fare for pessimists. And I don't just mean those of us living under the sword of Brexit. Except, of course, those leave voters who imagine the glorious future for our benighted isle. Now, I mean that if you read any news outlets today, paper or digital, you'll find loads of bad news, whether it's coming from Syria or the US border with Mexico or Venezuela, or principally, the White House. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's not just because bad news sells newspapers or wins hits on the web. It's also because bad news is what makes the world go round. I'm not kidding. If everything on Earth were fine and dandy, why seek change? So that's my first point. Bad news is the mother of good news. The catch is that bad news was always bad at the time it was bad. I mean, what else would you think if you saw victims of the Black Death piled up on the corner of a street, or if you were in the trenches in the First World War, or perhaps you were watching a tsunami approach you on some Indonesian island? Man, that's, that's bad, that's bad. 
In fact, when you're tra- struggling to survive, it's hard to imagine that sooner or later things will actually get better, if not for you personally, at least for humanity as a whole. But they do. Which is why today, when we feel overwhelmed by bad news, we should remember that better times lie ahead, because they always have. Okay, some evidence for this case. It's not just that we used to walk on all fours and now stand upright. Well, that certainly was considerable progress. It took us quite a while. But let's start with life expectancy in more recent times. For most of the past thousand years, if you survived being born, which is already an achievement, your chances of reaching 50 were pretty slim. And if you did, you'd spend a lot of your life attending funerals. (laughs) But today, with few exceptions, life expectancy is around 70, and in some countries, over 80. Over 90 gets a bit tricky. I have statistics to prove it. For the UK, in 2017, there were around 580,000 people over the age of 90 but only 14,000 over 100. So you can imagine the massacre that goes on during your 90s. However, for those who wish to look towards the sunshine, the expectation is that by 2050, instead of just a mere 14,000, there are going to be 280,000 Brits over 100. Now, you may think that a horrifying prospect, unless you're going to be one of them. Um, (laughs) But it's pretty remarkable. And the reason we know why, many diseases like smallpox and polio have been conquered. Many others can be cured or are in the process of being cured. Growing old has become quite pleasant. So we can put a big tick beside medicine. So how about living conditions? 100 years ago, there was incredible poverty in today's advanced countries. In fact, they still harbor some pockets of poverty. But in the richer half of the world today, the problem is now obesity not hunger. And in poorer countries, well, when some of us here, (coughs) happily, only a few of us here were young, we all remember that we were told to clean up our plates because of the starving children in India. Well, that's really the past, because then the Green Revolution came with the high-yielding grains, um, varieties of grains, and there's still some hunger in India, but nothing, nothing like, you don't hear it talked about, you talk about corruption, floods, whatever, but you don't hear about hunger. So the good thing is you don't have to clean up your plate anymore. And similarly, when it comes to clean water, the glass is definitely half full. Even in shanty towns, people can look forward to having running water and toilets at home. That's my second point. They can look forward. My third point is that people make their lives better by migrating. 19th century European migration to the US was a product of poverty. 20th century migration within Europe, a consequence of war. But in the past half century, there's been an unprecedented, huge movement of people across the world, driven by hope. Take the hundreds of millions of Chinese who've moved from the countryside to the cities, or the tens of millions of Brazilians who've moved from the arid northeast to Rio and Sao Paulo or Mexicans, either immigrants or or their children, who now number 35 million or 11% of the US population, or the many millions of people from the Indian subcontinent or Middle East or Africa who've come to Europe. Yes, immigrants sure face difficulties in language, culture, religion, even frequently hostility. Yet few want to return home because their lives are now better. I'll make one concession. Sometimes things have to get really bad before they get better. So here we are now with daily warnings of of what climate change will bring. Fiercer storms, longer droughts, coastal cities, and entire islands disappearing underwater, animal and plant species vanishing, all pretty grim. And yet, belatedly, not only governments, but also societies and individuals are reacting. Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion which would have caused much more trouble getting here if we were in London than today. But won't we all soon be driving electric cars? Isn't renewable energy in the shape of solar, wind, and wave power expanding rapidly? No, I know it doesn't help to have an American president who dismisses climate change as fake news, but 
Look at the number of American states that are taking their own measures against global warming. Yes, the immediate outlook may be alarming, but it's not like in the past, when Europe built its industries on coal and cut down most of its trees and didn't know what it was doing. Now we know and we're taking action. The way we live and consume in the future will be cleaner, safer, and more rational. It will be better. So you see, that in inviting you to support our motion and in some misguided people to change your minds, um, my argument is quite simple. History is on our side. For all the pandemics and wars and famines of the past, humanity has continued to advance. Whether it's thanks to our survival instinct or our remarkable ingenuity, the best is yet to come. Thank you. So the first speaker from uh, TCD Sides is Declan McAvana. Declan is a graduate from Trinity. He is the president of the French Debating Association and senior lecturer of the Department of Languages and Cultures at uh, Polytechnic. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. Chairman, cultural attaché, distinguished members of the proposition government, Prime Minister, thank you. The sun does not always shine. <laughs> I'm from Ireland. Come on, guys. <laughs> the sky can be gray. The horizon is not always welcoming. But we, the members of the opposition, do not live in, you'll forgive me, telly tubby land. <laughs> in true Celtic style, this debate is about threes. It's about trios. It's about triptychs. It's a kind of a, for our Breton friends, if there are any here, a, a kind of a triskel. It's about women, it's about men, and it's about children. It's about birth, and it's about death, and it's about what happens in between. It's about the past, it's about the present, but it's also about the future, I agree. There are three members on each side of this house. On the opposition side, we, the TCD side, we have something apart from the obvious of all being graduates of Trinity College, we have something in common. And that is the fact that the letter D, the letter D figures strongly in each of our names. <laughs> My colleague, Edward, our third speaker, is blessed with the name Donalyn. Our second speaker, David Doyle. <laughs> well, he goes even further. He's got a double whammy. <laughs> Whilst I, the opener, well, I have to make do with a simple Declan. Call us the three Ds. Because we as a team will show a 3D vision, a 3D perspective, a three-dimensional <laughs> version in our way of dealing with this motion. You can go even further. Here we are in the Irish Embassy. We can go even further in our analysis of this position and of this motion. St. Patrick, he resonates. He's here. 1,600 years ago, his explanation of the Trinity. We shall explain with my colleagues how three arguments can come together to form a single stem, giving greater strength to the overall impact. In short, without being 
overly pretentious. We are the Trinity Trinity. <laughs> if you permit me, I'll move on to another group of three individuals. The first, at the beginning of the 1960s, missed out on the opportunity to become one of the best known musicians in all of history. The second is considered within his own sphere to be one of the greatest artists of all time, even though his own career ended and his own life ended in alcoholism. And the third is currently the captain of this country's rugby team, and he is attempting at this very moment in Japan to lead that team to World Club glory. What do they have in common, apart from being exceptional human beings? One obvious thing, they were all called Best. <laughs> yes, Pete Best was replaced as drummer of the Beatles by a rising Ringo star. Maybe Pete misunderstood the meaning of this evening's motion and its implications. Was the best yet to come for him? <laughs> George Best, footballer, often dubbed the fifth Beatle. Yet after a brilliant career, he saw his life taper into melancholy and torpor. Would he have claimed that the best was yet to come? And Rory Best, at 37 years of age, could he still lead, Mr. The Cultural Attaché, could he still lead his nation's rugby team to the highest pinnacle in his sport? So maybe his best is yet to come. Did they miss out on the best in one case? Were they the best in the second case? Or is the best yet to come? But what's the point behind these three widely differing stories and, and the human beings who live them or who have or continue to live them? They are indeed, ladies and gentlemen, at the very basis of our, the opposition's approach to this motion this evening. We do not believe that any single blanket overall, all-encompassing statement, such as the best is yet to come, can be applied to the entire history of humanity. We do not believe that one can sum up in a single banal, cliched adage the struggles that have taken place, <coughs> that are currently being waged, and that will continue to be carried out by our fellow women and men. When the government states that the best is yet to come, by definition, it must refer to every single aspect of humanity, or else to humanity, generally speaking. My colleague David, our second speaker, will look at the present and how our post-baby boomer societies are failing to deal with the legacy of the past and the challenges that we and our children and our children's children are facing and how they can be met in the most positive way, even if we believe that the best is not necessarily to come. My colleague Edward will examine how the past has shaped us, not always in the best way, but it has shaped us in our current attitudes towards issues, issues, important issues, such as women's rights, human rights, even animal rights. Edward will show how human nature and its impact upon all that it touches can be positive, it can be negative, or maybe it's somewhere in between, possibly even all three at the same time. But yet, in harnessing the most, the most important thing about our mistakes, we as a human race we can nonetheless make the best of what is to come. We can make the best of what is to come. 
That doesn't mean that the best is yet to come, but that somehow we are condemned to repeat the cycle of mistakes, improvements, then more mistakes, and we would like to think perhaps even more improvement in every field of human endeavor. Ladies and gentlemen, we, the Trinity Trinity, we're not hard bringers of, of doom. No, indeed, we still believe that the change can be wrought, that progress can be made. We believe that the future is in our hands, yes, but we also believe that at this extremely important juncture in the history of mankind, it is now more than ever necessary, essential for us to understand the challenges that are facing us in the area of, indeed, the threat of growing inequality, civilizational confrontation, and perhaps the most important realm, which the Prime Minister mentioned in his speech, climate change. A challenge we have not before had the guts nor the scientific know-how to face up to. The attitude of humanity should not be based on a simple, simplistic the best is yet to come, but more on an idea that if we come together, we can fight perhaps for something better tomorrow. George W. Bush, Jr., not known as a philosopher, I grant it, <laughs> never said the best was yet to come, but he didn't say that tomorrow the future would be better. Think about it. <laughs> The idea that underpins our line, our attitude, our stance, is not one of pessimism, but one of understanding that well, we have always had the best in certain fields. We continue to have the best in other fields. We can strive, indeed, for the best in certain other fields, but that the cyclical nature of history combined with a true pragmatism can help lead us out of this relatively dark period. The cyclical nature of history, ladies and gentlemen, that means that sometimes things go up, sometimes they go down, and sometimes they just simply turn around. To conclude, our team does not aim at having you all go home with negative ideas. We do not seek to rob you of your hope for the future. But we do ask you to examine yesterday humanity's successes and failures, to observe the present, what is positive and negative, and thus to attempt to understand the possible future, not by blandly and in a blasé manner saying that the best is yet to come, but, but by believing that what we can improve, we will. What we cannot improve, we will attempt to understand why we cannot improve it. And that the rest, ladies and gentlemen, is up to the genius of our race. Thank you very much uh, to both speakers for these inspiring speeches. Uh, we'll now take a few comments uh, from the floor, namely two comments, one on each side. Uh, and uh, in uh, the interests of symmetry, we'll start with anyone who would like to speak in favor of the motion. You have one minute. Anyone in favor? All right, anyone against the motion? <laughs> right, anyone who would like to abstain? Well, they need more persuading. More okay, persuading. All, all right, <laughs> everybody needs more time, I suppose. Um, so um, I will introduce the second speaker, that's you, Andrew, right? 
so Andrew Lyndon Skeggs graduated from uh, Magdalen College, Cambridge, with a degree in economics. He has been a serial entrepreneur with a career in property development and the creation and flotation of various internet-related companies. Uh, he is currently a part-time photographer and, of course, the Paris Paris Cambridge Society's fearless leader. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here to talk on this quite important subject. Now, I'd envisage beginning my talk by having a natty little quotation usually assigned to Voltaire saying, I disagree with all you say, Declan, but I defend to the right your right to say it. <laughs> but I find that I don't need to say that because Declan seems to have been arguing for us. <laughs> Unless I was completely misunderstanding what I, he was saying, which is never impossible, I think he was saying, we have suffered many difficulties in the past, we have had many challenges in the past, but we can learn from those. And if we come together, which I think was his words, then we can solve them from the for the future and hence go forth with a better future. I can perhaps sit down, because he's already argued our case, saying the best is yet to come. If we get together, then we can achieve a better future. And I'm a great believer in the human race, and I believe we will get together but I'll come to that in a minute. Things ain't what they used to be. Duke Ellington, 1943. Things ain't what they used to be. Lionel Bart, 1950s. Fangs ain't what they used to be. Vampire comedy, uh, the South Bank of London, 2015. We seem to have a perpetual problem with thinking that things ain't what they used to be. How many of you have seen that lovely Woody Allen film, Midnight in Paris? Hands up, who's seen Midnight in Paris? Uh, roughly half of you, okay. Well, for the sake of those who didn't see that film, essentially the story was that an American scriptwright, Jill Pender, adored the 1920s in Paris. There's Annie Fall. He was delighted to find that he regressed in time into the 1920s, into the glorious Annie Fall. He met Hemingway, he met Fitzgerald, he met Gertrude Stein, he met Salvador Dali. I am Dali. He was absolutely delighted by this. He was even more delighted when he met up with Picasso and Modigliani's uh, girlfriend, Adriana. With Adriana, he goes off to Maxime's, he goes off to the Moulin Rouge. At the Moulin Rouge, they find Henri Toulouse Lautrec. And they realize that they've regressed still further in time, back to the Belle Epoque. Adriana thinks this is absolutely wonderful. She says, this is the epoch I've always dreamed of. I don't want to be in the boring 1920s. And Jill Pender says to her, but Adriana, if you remain in the Belle Epoque, you're going to find that it becomes your present. And you're going to start thinking quite soon that actually another epoch is really your golden epoch. The film curiously goes on, and it goes back to the court of Louis XIV. Had it gone on further, I suspect the court of Louis XIV would have dreamt of fighting with Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc herself might have dreamt of taking off her armor and snuggling up to a chunky chrome magnon man in a cozy cave in the Dordogne. <laughs> it has always been like this. In spite of the fact that all of the evidence seems to be that the world is getting better, not in every detail, Declan, I accept that, but I think we can understand averages. In general terms, the world seems to be getting better. We only have to go along the same trajectory to find that the best is in the future. Why are we so programmed to be nostalgic, to be looking back at the past or is believing that our present, and even more so the future, is less good than those lovely times in the past? For as I say, it has ever been us. There's always been a problem with modern inventions, modern technology. Even back in the Victorian times, uh, when steam engines were first invented, they were a monster. They were going to frighten the horses, they were going to ruin the countryside. Now, of course, we think back to steam engines with a sort of sepia-tinted memory. Art Deco, gracious dining, plumes of smoke, touch of Agatha Christie. Why do we have this tendency to nostalgia? There are many, many explanations, and certainly not time this evening to go through them all, but just touching on one or two things to give a hint of why we perhaps are nostalgic and like the past more than the future. When we're young, we are fit, we're healthy, we're enthusiastic, we're ambitious. <coughs> With age, some of those things start to wear a little thinner. 
We find the world changes, and we don't quite change with the world. We find it more difficult to adjust ourselves to the world. And hence we get the feeling that our life was lovely when we were at Cambridge, perhaps when we were at TCD. We, life was wonderful, but it's got less good. And therefore, extrapolating forwards, the future is going to be less good than it is now. You touched on the news and the horrors that happened. We are totally conditioned by the news. And it's the horrors that we hear about. The famines, the wars, the acts of terrorism, all these things. All the evidence seems to be that that is just a minor part of what is going on. But it's the part that impinges on us because it's a horrific, it's immediate. The news, perfectly understandably, doesn't report on the nice day that was passed in the Upper Napa Valley. Folk went to work, the trains ran on time, it was a gloriously warm day. Fortunately, they could leave work early. They went home, had a cup of coffee, and went for an early bed. That is not what news is made up of. It's made up of the horrors. And it is that that conditions us. Alan has quite rightly, rightly touched on some evidence of how the world has been and is getting better. Life expectancy, there can't be much more fundamental than that. Back in the 19th century, life expectancy worldwide, as Alan has pointed out, was 35 years. It is now 70 years. Infant mortality. All the pictures we see in the papers of, sadly, starving children, diseased children, and so on. The good thing is that is actually getting less and less all the time. Back in the 19th century, 35% of children died before the age of five. That self-same percentage now is down to about 3 or 5%. It is much, much better. Poverty, another thing which Alan touched on. Again, extrapolating back to the 19th century, 90% of the world lived in extreme poverty. That, contrary to the impression we get from the media, is down to about 10%. Now, it perhaps gets boring to keep on talking about graphs, trajectories, tendencies, and so on. Pluck out some things, good things, that are happening right here and now. There are hundreds. So I'm going to confine myself just to three, because they happen to have been in the papers either today or yesterday. 5G communication. Much, much, much faster and better than 3G or 4G. It's not just a question of mobile phones getting better, downloading films faster and so on. This will be the fastest means of communicating that the world has ever had. It will be the basis of electric driverless cars. It will be the means of having medical operations at a distance. Another thing in the, in the papers yesterday, quantum computers. They're just beginning. These are going to be monumentally more powerful than our existing computing systems. And they will enable us to unravel problems, mysteries, and the basis of, for example, diseases in a way that we cannot do at the present time. And then the holy grail, energy. At the present time, yes, we have wind farms, we have all these things, waves and so on. Most of our energy comes from nuclear fission. In the future, we will have nuclear fusion. And when we have nuclear fusion, we will have an almost indefinite supply of cheap, clean, carbon-free energy. And these sorts of improvements are big, big improvements in the world. And it's very difficult to argue to say that the world is not getting better. If you don't like those arguments, we could take maybe three more. I'm told that because of the climate change, some of the wine-growing districts are going to be producing wine far more delicious than anything which you drink at the present time. The most beautiful women in the world, and indeed men, will be even more beautiful in the future. And a time will come where rap music falls out of popularity. <laughs> <laughs> like Alan, though, at this stage, I'm going to add a caveat, and it's an important caveat. Those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first grant their wishes. For the next 50 or more years, we are going to be given the world's bounty in a way that we have never known before. We're going to have more possibilities than humankind could ever have envisaged. That is not necessarily to say that they will be to our benefit. It could be to our benefit, it could be destructive. But the good thing is that it will be in our hands as human beings, whether it's one or the other. 
And personally, as I said at the beginning, I have a certain faith in, in humanity. It seems to me that over the course of history, in our own curious way, we have sort of stumbled along the right path. And for that reason, I believe that as we move forward into the technological era, human beings, in their own chaotic, disorganized, argumentative fashion, will make the right decisions. And that this incredible era, era that we're embarking upon will prove to be hugely for the benefit of mankind. Nostalgia is a wonderful thing. It's warm, it's comforting, it's cosy. But I would say to everyone in this room and elsewhere, do not be mealy mouthed. Do not allow nostalgia to blind you to the future. Do not be so enmeshed in the folds of nostalgia that you do not engage with others for the future to determine that the future runs to the benefit of mankind. Because if we succeed in this, then we can say to our children, our grandchildren, our heirs to come, you think that you have seen the sun, but you ain't seen it shine. Wait until the sunshine day. You ain't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come. Um, so the second uh, speaker is uh, His Excellency David Dole. is uh, a graduate from Trinity College Dublin and ambassador to UNESCO of St. Kitts and Nevis. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to continue the protocol by thanking the outgoing president of the TCD alumni, who's done a fabulous job, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your kind words. I also like to recognize the attache of cultural affairs of the Irish Embassy and, of course, our distinguished members of the opposition. Now, what I'm going to talk about this evening is uh, not necessarily pessimistic, but it's uh, a series of issues that I believe are not ephemeral, they're not conjunctural, they're structural. And this is what worries me an awful lot about going forward. I take the view that conceivably the best is really behind us. Over the past decade alone, we've observed the, the, in the developed world an unholy trinity, forgive the pun, uh, of slowing productivity growth, um, soaring uh, inequality, hugely damaging financial crises and shocks, to which I might add a struggling post-baby boomer generation totally excluded from the economic prosperity that we the baby boomers uh, created, a general demise also of the multilateral uh, uh, consensus building uh, apparatus that we built up after the Second World War. Let me start with the growing inequality in the developed world. Gross income uh, inequality in the developed countries actually increased very, very significantly uh, between 2008 to 2012, the beginning of the financial crisis. Um, and that, in fact, it's 12, uh, much more significantly than the 12 previous years, according to the OECD. Even in Europe, where supposedly inequality is less pronounced, it still raises some very important ethical questions. For example, in Western Europe, many do not receive a real living wage, despite working hard. Many are trapped, as we all know if we have kids, in fixed term contracts. Plus, data shows uh, with depressing regularity that 10% of earners in Europe, uh, and much the same figures are prevalent in the United States, actually end up holding a third of all the national wealth. Now this might help to explain why we're having so many difficulties with populism, uh, the sense that many people are being left behind, uh, growing impatient, that things are not being uh, developed in the way they should be, in terms of improvements to their lifestyle or even worsening their, their living conditions. Putting this in the longer term economic context, a Harvard University study about a, about a year ago showed that the real medium income of a family between 1948 and 73 rose by 3% per year. Today, that figure languishes or languishes at 0.4%. Again, uh, accentuating the inequality factors that we're dealing with. 
The fact of the matter is, and this is the most startling, depressing statistic, which I believe is structural, 28% of children today in the developed world will have lower and already have lower income than their parents did, exasperating even further the challenges of inequality. But also, inequality, uh, if we listen to the OECD, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, is reaching middle classes in many societies. Rising income uh, inequality is an issue of, of huge ethical uh, proportions. It motivates, uh, obviously, human behavior. It affects how we consume, save, and invest. And for many, it also determines simple things like access to credit to be able to buy a house, uh, the choice of schools that you want to put your kids into because they got better results, et cetera, et cetera. But in turn, it also affects economic growth. The question that must arise on these conditions is, are unequal societies the best or the most solid basis for economic growth going forward? Part of the reasons, of course, go back to the 1980s, which most of you may remember, when there were huge transfers of public to private wealth, which occurred in practically all countries, both rich and emerging. While national wealth in every country in Europe and the United States has substantially increased in the last decade, public wealth, by that I mean measured in terms of the quality of education, the quality of hospitals, infrastructure, transport, etc., is now at a negative or close to zero rate in all of the rich countries. No exceptions to that particular rule. Arguably, the limits of the ability of governments to deal with these issues and tackle them in terms of inequality are very, very limited. National policies, however, can shape the ownership of capital, and it's a major factor in addressing these issues. Now, this is not just simply, in my view, an issue about reducing inequality to make society fairer. That's a rather simplistic approach, in my view. Equal societies have huge other outcomes, notably political and social uh, stability, education that I've spoken about already, crime and financial stability, all of these factors suffer when we have an inequality uh, factor as high as we have at the moment across the developing world. Now, my second assertion is the struggling post-baby boomer generation. Um, these are people, the so-called millennials. They were born uh, after people like myself. They're failing simply uh, as a factor of an escalator factor, as we call it. And there are, not, they are simply not benefiting from the prosperity built up since the end of the Second World War. This has created, of course, a thing known as generational imbalances, which is very important. Right now, the dice are very heavily loaded in favor of the baby boomers, like myself, born uh, two decades after the Second World War, and are loaded very distinctly against the uh, millennials. Young people today are understandably very anxious about housing, jobs, pensions, while those um, of my age group, understandably, according to surveys, health, social care, fragility of the welfare state, but also uh, increasingly, particularly in the last decade, we're also concerned about the future of our, of our own children. Studies in developed nations reveal with depressing regulatory, regulatory, regularity the profound cross-generational pessimism that comes through in all of these surveys. The stalling of sustained and improved standard of living for this particular group of generation has potentially catastrophic implications for the country's well-being and the economic growth. Life, money, opportunities is just no longer an elastic factor as it was for my generation. A minority of millennials uh, and post-baby boomer people are indeed rich, but it's not the majority. Just look at some of the statistics. Property prices, whether it's New York, or London, or Paris, or even Dublin, are inaccessible to most of these people. Many of them are underemployed. They're not uh, unemployed, they're underemployed. Jumping from fixed term contracts one after the other because corporates are not prepared to give them a, a permanent contract. Some burdened with student loans. A third of millennials don't even own their own home. Uh, compared with uh, two-thirds of the uh, baby boomers the same age. It takes 19 years now to actually save up to put down a deposit, compared to three years back in the 1980s. Just to quote, um, perhaps, and encapsulate this concern that I have, 
I'm going to quote Francis O'Grady, the General Secretary of the Trade Union Council in the United Kingdom, and I quote, we are facing a new set of problems, he said. We have people with degrees doing Mickey Mouse jobs, young people who have no occupational pensions, no house to sell to see them through their, their, uh, their old age. That's not a, the fault of the mum and dad. If we think that, we are tackling the wrong problems. It's about redistributing, and it's not about redistributing, he says, the crumbs from the rich man's uh, pockets, end of quote. Adding to that is the, uh, uh, my last point, very close to me in the work that I do as a diplomat, the general demise of the multilateral, multilateral system. We have massive trade conflicts at the moment, uh, dragging on between China, Europe, and elsewhere. It seems to make sense that we settle these, uh, these issues uh, in revised terms of trade in a transparent and enforceable manner. Otherwise, for the next 15 to 20 years, believe me, we'll be characterized by mounting uh, lists of tariffs that can only prove to be detrimental to the economy. Now, you're saying to me, so what? We've been through this already, except that we're on the brink of a recession or a very lengthy period of deflation. And what is accentuating this trend is the withdrawal of the two most influential powers that emerged from the Second World War, who forged the consensus on the rebuilding of Europe in the non-communist world, that is. They've all moved beyond the multilateral institutional framework, the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD, even the EU, and are now relying distinctly on bilateral uh, one-size-fits-all uh, type uh, agreements. And to deal with all the problems we have to deal with, decarbonization of the environment, uh, illegal immigration, trade, it's just no longer a, a sustainable way of dealing with things. In conclusion, the way we manage our economic and social and political systems in the developed world must change or we really will perish. These are particularly complex issues uh, that require a multilateral, collegial-driven approach to the issues. But let me conclude with a statement from the US political commentator from the early 19th, 20th century, Henry Louis uh, Mencken, who said, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. I rest my case. Thank you. Uh, the third speaker on the Cambridge side, Edward Archer, uh, graduated from St. John's College, Cambridge. Uh, has pursued a career in banking at JP Morgan uh, and HSBC in London, New York, and Paris, uh, mm -hmm. and is, in, uh, is one of our champion debaters. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can all hear me. I don't particularly like microphones. Um, Co chairman and uh, attache. Um, well, we've all been treated to four extremely erudite speeches uh, so far on a lot of the recent, fairly recent past and uh, the immediate future uh, of our society. Uh, well, I'm afraid this is the point where all of that comes to an end uh, this evening. Hopefully not the erudite bit, uh, but certainly the focus on the immediate future of our society. Why? Well, I think that uh, when we're talking about the best is yet to come, and I disagree with Declan on this, we have to be talking about something simple, about human achievement. And to look at human achievement, we need to examine that over a much longer period of time than we've discussed so far today. So uh, if you'll bear with me, let me just start with a brief history of the world, okay? Um, it won't take long, I promise you. Um, I know. Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. Okay, then we skip forward a bit. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs became extinct. And why did that happen? Well, there was a six mile wide meteorite that crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, threw up huge amounts of dust. Um, it went around the world, it obscured the sun, uh, temperatures plunged, and 90% of the life forms on Earth perished uh, at that time. Then we skip forward a bit, and uh, we can go to the origins of man, which um, can be traced back to about six million years ago. 
And then modern man didn't evolve until about 200,000 years ago. So that was great. But then, I don't know if any of you know this, but about 75,000 years ago, we nearly got wiped out. It wasn't a meteorite this time, but uh, there was a volcano in Indonesia called Toba, and that erupted, and that was the most violent uh, volcanic event uh, that's hit the Earth in the last 25 million years. So that threw up loads and loads of dust. It covered the sun, all the same things that happened to the, uh, to the dinosaurs. And that covered Malaysia, India, it went over Africa, and many humans perished uh, at that time. But our ancestors, thankfully that's why we're here, uh, a lot of them, well, they managed to escape, and they didn't have anything with them, but they, uh, they, they came towards Europe, and that's why we're here today. Now, to put that all in a kind of perspective, let's, uh, let's consider, say, a year, 1st of January to 31st of December. Let's say the origins of man six million years ago are the beginning of January the 1st, and now we're at midnight on the 31st of December. Well, modern man didn't evolve until the 18th of December, so really not very long ago. And uh, then we were nearly wiped out on uh, the 26th of December, so a great Boxing Day present uh, for, uh, for humans. So in terms of this scale, I, whilst I found all the other speeches very, very interesting, um, they're really only covering just the equivalent of a few minutes in terms of uh, human history. And so I would argue that, uh, to a large extent, they're kind of irrelevant uh, to the question that we're facing this evening. And look how far we've come since Boxing Day, okay? Uh, our when our ancestors were escaping from Toba, they just, uh, they had nothing. Today we have uh, food. Uh, like we say, obesity is more of a problem than hunger. We have housing. We have health care. We have transport. And we are able to um, share information. So what of the future? Uh, well, I would ask you for a moment to put aside all the current day troubles of the world that uh, David covered very, very completely, I must say, uh, and come and dream with me uh, for a few minutes. What more can humans achieve? Well, to quote uh, a chap who some of you may have come across, Gene Rodenbury, space, the final frontier to boldly go where no man has gone before. I put it to you that mankind's future achievement will involve exploring beyond this planet and finding other homes among the stars. Why? Well, partly because it's in our nature to explore and progress, and also because, frankly, it's in our own interest. I mean, all Earth has already witnessed five major extinction cycles, uh, and on each of those, about 90% of the life forms on the Earth perished. Um, and what happens if we have another big meteor that hits the Earth? You know, wouldn't it be better if we have an alternative uh, to escape to? But is this possible, you ask? Absolutely it is. Um, now, I'm not a scientist, I was a banker, but uh, I did read a book by a very clever professor called uh, Michio Kaku, uh, in the States, who gave some guidance on how uh, all of this may, be, may come about. And he suggests that it's all going to be facilitated by future technological advances. So, again, I think it's important to put these in a historical perspective. And, in fact, technological advances, some of them uh, Andrew alluded to, they tend to come in waves or, or phases. So, in the 19th century, we had mechanics and thermodynamics, and that brought us the locomotive and it led to the Industrial Revolution. The 20th century, we had electricity and magnetism, and so that was the dawning of the electronic age. In the 21st century now, we have high tech, so we have the internet, we have these supercomputers, we have global positioning systems, and they were all spearheaded by quantum physicists who invented the transistor and the laser. And on the way, we have new things. We have artificial intelligence coming. We have nanotechnology, and we have biotechnology. And later on, maybe we have even more. We have maybe antimatter engines, even warp drives a la Star Trek. So um, all of these things are to come. Now, if we do want to leave the Earth uh, or expand, who's going to do it? Well, I think it's going to be a combination of the state and the private sector 
Uh, I mean, look, the USA already put a man on the moon in 1969, but since then, the state spending on space exploration has uh, declined. But now it's picking up again in conjunction with billionaire entrepreneurs. So Amazon's Jeff Bezos, oh, God, my goodness, uh, is uh, going to the moon. I'll speed up. Elon Musk has set his sights on Mars, and uh, even in October 2015, NASA announced the goal of sending astronauts to, to Mars. Now, other planets are a long way off, so how can we do it? Well, I suggest we do it through a series of baby steps, like the Polynesians thousands of years ago when they wanted to cross the Pacific. They didn't do it all in one and go. They would have all been killed. They did it by island hopping, and they built um, a chain of permanent settlements uh, across the Pacific. So if we expand beyond the Earth, um, one of the hardest things for us is going to be getting materials off the Earth because of our gravity. But the good news is that there are a lot of these materials in space. And uh, they can either be used to build out there or they can be mined for profit to finance the program. In fact, the asteroid belt is full of rare earths and valuable metals. So how might this work? Well, first stop would probably be the moon. Okay. There, there's an estimated 600 million tons of ice in the northern polar region. Plus, we can mine the soil, which is very similar to Earth's and full of oxygen. So it should be possible to create a moon base. We could send the initial equipment up from Earth, and then we can use local resources. And we can use robots with artificial intelligence to make the preparations for the humans to arrive. Landing and taking off will be very easy because there's not a lot of gravity. The next step after that would probably be Mars, because um, uh, there um, there's a lot of ice and methane, all the elements to uh, produce water, oxygen and heat, and uh, it should be possible to terraform Mars and create a settlement. Again, we could have robots with artificial intelligence doing the preparations and humans following. And from there we can go further in the solar, into our, our solar system, not probably Jupiter and Saturn, they're big gas balls that are really horrible and cold. But they have moons going around them, and one of them, Titan, also has ice and methane, and that could be used as a, as, as a post. And then from there on, we, could leave our, uh, we would have to leave our solar system. Now, it's been estimated there are billions of Earth-like planets that are in the livable area surrounding their, orbiting their suns, but they're a long way away. And getting there will take ages, certainly longer than current human lifespan, and require greater speed. But we have many possibilities. If it were possible today to offer a two-week package to a tropical paradise planet orbiting Alpha Centauri, then maybe Thomas Cook would still be in business. <laughs> Thank you. So, our third and um, last speaker is Dr. Edward Donnellan. Is a treaty graduate, is a barrister, and uh, work for the OECD before becoming an independent consultant in regulatory management. Uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished cultural attaché, distinguished colleagues from uh, Oxford, no, sorry, it's Cambridge. <laughs> and of course, of course, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the beginning of this evening, I, I thought about Kafka, who said, there is infinite hope. But he then said, not for us. And having, <laughs> having heard Cambridge, I agree with that entirely. That the best is yet to come opens up a huge field of inquiry. And when I thought about it first, I thought perhaps we should just talk about something specific and narrow, such as comedy, humor. And I thought of the Marx Brothers and how they really haven't been improved on yet. You'll all be familiar with the quote from, I think it was Doc Soup, where Groucho says, I shot an elephant in my pajamas this morning. How he got there, I'll never figure it out. <laughs> You've heard very strong arguments on either side. Declan gave us a kind of balanced view, and David gave us the real hard uh, evidence and the hard facts that... Um, there are trends that are very disturbing. Uh, we've just heard from Edward, and I never thought I'd hear a Cambridge man split an infinitive. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I also never thought I'd hear a Cambridge man quoting from Michael Caine. I don't know if many people know this, but... <laughs> uh, but I, I, it was good that you took such a widespread. 
but you're looking like all British people, I'm afraid, at the past. What we're concerned with is not the past, the future. And uh, your, your colleague, Andrew, kind of contradicted that because he said we shouldn't be uh, tied up with nostalgia. Whereas what you were doing was looking back to dinosaurs and meteors and, <laughs> I don't know, things, uh, things they didn't write, write about in the Bible. One of you also mentioned uh, how people are, are getting living longer. But if you, if you read the Bible, as of course one does every day, uh, <laughs> but to balance that I also read the Koran and the Bud <laughs> Buddha stuff. And I watch, actually I don't watch television anymore. It's too boring. Uh, since I see, saw myself once on television, I thought that was it. Uh, people in the Bible used to live 100 years. But you, you can't believe everything you read in the Bible. And it's also very anti-feminine. I mean, after all, the problems of the world were put down to Eve. It was her fault. And uh, you go through the Bible, uh, if, if you, any of you are interested to do so, you'll find a lot of things that um, uh, suggest that women are a threat to the universe, not a benefit. I don't agree with that. The problem with the world is the people who populate it. And... <laughs> I don't mean you guys, I mean you're, you're a beautiful audience, uh, at least so far. <laughs> and if you look at who, where, if you want to make money, will you make money in the world today? You make it from arms, pharmaceuticals, uh, alcohol and tobacco. Oh my God, is that, a good, is that good or bad? And is, is that getting better or worse? I don't think so. You can also argue that the advances in technology, especially information technology, but I, I agree with the, the gentleman who stood up and, and uh, spoke on both sides of the motion, from both sides of his mouth, <laughs> very <laughs> articulately, and said that basically uh, all this information technology is not make necessarily making the world a better place. School children now have in their pockets devices which give them access to all the information the world has ever known. But does that make them any wiser? And are they getting any more intelligent? And will they their generation benefit from all these so-called advances. You can certainly also argue that there's been no major wars since 1945. The big countries have, have held off, but they've continued to grow huge arms resources. And sooner or later, somebody's going to have to make use of all those fabulous toys that they've all got. And at some point, there will be a conflagration. And we're, we're, we're sitting on the edge of that. Um, we're also sitting on the edge of uh, an endless stream of bad news. Now, you can certainly, I, I accept the argument that there, there is the risk that if you only look for your information from the mass media and from the newspapers, newspapers are designed to sell on the basis of bad news. A good news story doesn't sell. You know, granny helped across the street by helpful man does not sell newspapers, whereas Granny kicked to death by <laughs> drunken Irish man in Leeds. That's front page news. You can argue also very realistically, and I think this is what we've been trying to do on this side of the table, that the re-emergence, and David has made this point, that the re-emergence of nationalism and xenophobia bodes ill for all of us. Because while we are white and we have a certain supremacy in, in certain parts of the world, uh, that, that, that is declining. I mean, we could see in 20 years' time China running the world, and we would then be the uh, other side of the spectrum. We would be the people who are discriminated against. The other point that David made very validly is the um, risk to global prosperity posed by the risks that are taking place at the moment to globalism. Where we've made our money over the, since the Second World War is through world trade. And the re-emergence of trade barriers and um, idiocies such as things that we see in islands near us uh, make us worry about the future and uh, <coughs> worry about the country that once led the world, that gave us the best parliament in the world, that gave us the great writers like Keats and Wordsworth and Shakespeare, uh, where are they going? What's going to happen to them next? There's also a rise of terrorism, and we've seen that in the last couple of days. There's been some dramatic stories, and I, I don't think you can just dismiss that as fake news or 
an exaggeration. These things are happening, and they are threats. And the biggest threat of all, I think, is the, the risk of isolationism. The United States led the world from the Second World War onwards. They acted as a beacon uh, for democracy, for the rule of law, for trade. Now they're pulling back on themselves, and so much for the notion of bring me your tired, huddled masses. It's more like now, um, shoot them <laughs> at the <laughs> I mean, can you imagine someone saying that? And when he was told, you can't shoot people, he said, why not? You can shoot them in the legs. It's not the same thing. <laughs> where we're going, I think, depends very fundamentally on where we've been. And, you know, forget about the dinosaurs and all the rest of it. Uh, what we've got to be concerned about is human nature and the fact that it hasn't changed. I was in London this morning, and um, it brought to mind the, the marvellous book written by Dickens in 1859, A Tale of Two Cities. And uh, what Dickens said in the opening paragraph of that book is very much applicable, and he should, perhaps he should have been with us today as part of our team. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Thank you. Well, you've heard from me and from the loyal opposition that bad news sells, but I hope you're not the consumers tonight. It's very easy to take in bad news. It's always more difficult to accept that there may be an alternative. It's, oh, things are bad. Oh, things are bad. I would even take Ireland. I mean, for years you could say things were bad in Ireland. But if you look 20 years ago, and now, or 15 years ago, or 30 years ago, extraordinary transformation. Now, we've looked a bit at the past and how it's actually, with two steps forward, one step back, has actually advanced humanity in different ways. We've looked towards the stars and the knowledge that things that we could never imagine are already happening, and so we have to accept the possibility of these things. But we're consumed with today because that's the news we're bomb bombarded with, or even the articles and analysis. So I just want to address one question that David addresses, because he put his finger on things that worry us more, more, more than just uh, in passing. The thing that inequality... Now, poverty, if, if you look... If ever you read, for example, um, Orwell before the war, uh, the road to Wigan Pier, for example, the misery, the absolute incredible misery that existed there. In the 19th century, the inequality in the United Kingdom, plus in other countries, was unbelievable. It's actually been a relatively short period wrought by the Second World War and the, and the changes that occurred afterwards, the, the Trente Glorieuses in France and and what happened in England up to the mid-70s, really, probably up to the big um, oil crises of 74, <clears throat> 73, 74. But there was an extraordinary change. Now, it's absolutely true that th there's been an acceleration of, um, uh, since, uh, since maybe the 80s, since the Thatcherism and Reaganism and all of that stuff, a transfer of wealth into private hands in a big way, and an extraordinary amount of concentration of wealth across the world. But, I make the point, it's a dangerous moment, there's no question about it, but why do I see something positive in the future? Because there is a reaction, and populism, while it's dangerous and worrying, is a form of reaction and demanding, and, and the, the, you're beginning to get, again, movements of youth, young people are getting particip participating in, in politics in a way that they haven't done for a long time, and essentially, we're moving into a period of transition, which will be disruptive, but it will be, in a sense, in place of war. And it will be painful, but out of this, I think you will begin to get new organizations of society, new organizations even internationally. But to get there, as always, as I've described in my earlier comments, as, al as, as always, one almost has to touch the bottom and get to a level of, of distress and chaos and for, hum for humanity to react. So. While it, it, there's no question about it that it's an alarming moment that we're, link, that 
you know, aggravated by a particular person in the White House who was leading a lot of these things. But you have to remember that Americans, at least for the moment, will continue to lead as, as they did in the Reagan times. Um, but that period is also ending, a period in which the United States will be able to dominate and define everything on Earth. And so while it will be a period of uncertainty, I am actually confident that the fear of massive, or perhaps the, the reality of considerable unrest in societies is actually going to produce the changes um, and, and, shall we say, the vaccination to what is happening now. So even though we can't pretend that these are really cheerful days, um, I do believe that, once again, humanity will respond angrily, violently perhaps, but will respond and will emerge the better for it. So I think the best is yet to come. <laughs> So uh, Deccan McKevena will uh, sum, up, uh, sum, up, sum up the TCD. Yeah, I don't think I need a microphone either, to be honest with you. <laughs> Can you hear me at the back over there? Yes, my daughter's filming. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm kind of worried. Bad news is the mother of all news. That's what we were told. Well, the good news is that it's uh, no bad news tonight, because, Madam Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Kosovo Attache, members of the government, ladies and gentlemen of this house, at the outset of this debate, a little over an hour ago, I made reference to the fact that this evening would concern a number of trios. You remember? Thank you. Please allow me to finish off this evening's entertainment with a reference to another set of wonderful, gifted human beings. The members of this evening's government from Cambridge. I started by telling you that we, on the Trinity side, we were the three Ds. But in fact, we are opposed to the three A's. The three A's. Alan Riding, Edward Archer, and Andrew Leiden Skeggs. They are certainly the A's, the three A's, on account of their agility, their aplomb, their abilities, but not on account of their assertions, not on account of their assumptions, and especially not on account of their arguments. <laughs> Gentlemen, and I do rue the fact that there are no ladies on either side. Yeah. But if you've had a good time, and if we have all had a good time this evening, this first event could possibly become an annual event. And if there are ladies in the audience who would be tempted <coughs> Well, obviously, you're more than welcome. But allow me to delve a little bit deeper into the arguments of the government. Prime Minister Allen, he told us that this debate was about optimists versus pessimists. But then his colleague Edward told us it was all about Star Trek. <laughs> yes to boldly go where no man had gone before. I, uh, in my own speech, said that was kind of Teletubby land, but I wasn't thinking that we were looking forward to five millennia in the future. I was, you know. We are not pessimists. We purely and simply are pragmatists, gentlemen. We live in the real world, the concrete world. In the words of the great Irish author James Joyce, in the dead, the palpable world. The second Cambridge speaker, Andrew, he went on to build on the shaky foundation of, <clears throat> rather in the way, if you permit me, of the three little pigs from the fable of that name. <laughs> 
He told us it was all about the future being better. Better, better, I repeat. But not about it being the best. Technology is the answer, he told us. Yes, we will, and I quote, we will have more possibilities than ever before. Sure, if we're still around. <laughs> and our children, and our grandchildren, certainly. You ain't seen nothing yet, we were told. Well, yeah, we ain't seen nothing yet, but I would like to be around to see whatever it is. So, ladies and gentlemen, my colleague David assured him in the current context that we cannot rely on modern technology alone to pull us out of this morass. We have to examine all aspects of all fields of endeavor of humanity before we can clearly pronounce ourselves on the motion. And that is exactly what the TCD team has done tonight. Then the third Cambridge speaker, Edward, he failed to see the missed opportunities of his two previous speakers, and he refused the advice of the third little pig to build his argument on concrete and with bricks. In his short history of mankind, he used substandard material, and he found that his house, too, was blown away by the big bad wolf of the opposition, my colleague Edward. Well, you know, he's not so nasty, really, to be honest with you. But he made it clear that sometimes we as humanity, sometimes, sometimes, well, you know, we lose some. Sometimes we win some. And sometimes it's just a plain draw. Let me come back to Edward from Cambridge. And allow me if I may, because he, he made me think of the words of the great Belfast poet, Cian Carson, who passed away this week, and whom I was indeed privileged to call my next-door neighbor when I lived in Belfast as a, a young boy. He ends his poem, which is called Letters from the Alphabet, with a two-line stanza representing the final letter, Z. And I quote, in the morning, you open up the envelope. You will get whatever message is inside. It is for all time. Its postmark is the 12th of never. So I'm afraid that's uh, 19 votes in favour of the motion. Now, who would like to vote in um, opposition? <laughs> I'm afraid your record is unbroken. It, <laughs> uh, it is 49 votes um, against the motion. Anyone would like to abstain? Ah, yes. <laughs> and, and four abstentions. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew, you'd like to thank you very much. Don't worry, I'm not going to restart the entire debate all over again, although uh, I'm now taking off my speaker hat and putting back on President of Cambridge hat. First of all, to thank the Embassy very much indeed for having invited us, hosted us. Last year we challenged Oxford to a debate, this year we challenged TCD to a debate and it has been absolutely wonderful. We have very much enjoyed the entire process building up to it, the process this evening. I'm sure the best is yet to come, but <laughs> we've, we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. Finally, thank all of you for being here.